the amazing testimony. What something good has happened to some of our people. Proclaim Jesus' blood over workplace. On March 17, Pastor preached on Jesus' blood. Pastor pointed out where I could cover my workplace with Jesus' blood because Jesus' blood can take away our work stress. On Monday, I used the sermon notes to quickly proclaim Jesus' blood at my workplace. Praise the Lord. Things went smoothly for the week. Thank you, Jesus, for His blood. Amen. Amen. Right. Second testimony. Sister led me back to church and very blessed. We were voted the most outstanding developer, the best high-rise building, as well as the best family-centric development last year. However, there was a cost for it. We worked literally 24-7. I even worked on Sundays. Gone were my younger days, where I was very involved in church activities. Thereafter, I became um, too involved in business. I drifted away, and the only time I went to church was twice a year. That was the past. Through God's grace, I have a very persistent sister who had been nagging me over the years. She called me to come for services, but I kept on procrastinating and postponing. She told me that there was free lunch after service. We could enjoy good food. That was September 2015. I really feel that this church is good for me. Pastor services are very engaging and I can relate to the services. Thank you, big sister. I remember pastor told us to pray for provision, which I did on the first day of, our, of the trip. Surprisingly, this morning, I got a call from KL. We got a big breakthrough from this overseas investor who was interested in my project. I couldn't describe it, but it was great. Lastly, I'd like to thank pastor and team for the wonderful trip. I was here 15 years ago, but today's experience was totally different. I really enjoyed the fellowship that was so overflowing. And there was a young girl who sat behind me who gave me a piece of heat pack. I was shivering from the head to toe. Another sister sat beside me in the bus writing notes and reading the Bible. I think I got a lot to learn from the group and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Amen. And the third testimony, an anointed word, something good is going to happen, came to pass. All glory to Jesus. Pastor Kerry gave a word last week to expect something good to happen this week. Breakthroughs upon breakthroughs shall come. I had anxiety about my new business. I was worried about how I could bring in monthly income. And seeking God was my only comfort. This week, I have been spending quite time in His word and God told me, two days in a row to stay bold and courageous, for he will perform what he has begun in his work. Hanging on to his word was my only assurance. There was a payment that seemed difficult to get through, but on Monday itself, it was paid. Amen. A full week later, another designer asked me for the invoice for completing another stage. Praise to God that I received two good news on payment within a week. This is great. His goodness happened to me twice. Thank you, Jesus, forever. Thank Amen. you, Pastor, jo Pastor Joshua and Pastor Kerry for anointed words. Amen. Amen. Set up on the right, something good is going to happen. Your greatest breakthrough. Okay, a couple of highlights before we take the offering uh, is the retreat. We're going to have a retreat, first retreat in RLC after 15 years. And yeah, the details are here, and our staff team has sculpted the place. And the one part is a bit run down, but the one that we book is well kept. And uh, even the safari part was beautiful, good for the family. So it's a family retreat. Yeah, so variety of uh, room from suite to VIP suite from every budget. But I know some people, even this uh, can be a strain in, in your budget. It's okay. Be open to talk to your zone pastor. This is a family. There's nothing shy about. I can't afford it. Just tell the zone pastor. As a family, we try our best so that everybody can go for this retreat. Some have more, some have less. But as a family, we help one another. So the key thing is be blessed with a bumble harvest. Uh, that's the uh, vision of this retreat. That we can experience the bumble harvest. I'm sure you know April 14 is Mission Sunday, whereby we remember our mission partners. They've been working very hard in the field. We just support them from our tithes and offering, but they really work hard in the heat of the day. And Mission Month, from now until uh, Sunday, 14th of April, is a time where we come together to pray for our mission partner at the same time to rekindle our support. And on that day, of course, we take an extra mission offering. And time to time, there are extra needs. For example, in Vietnam, we just got the news that we want to help them. They ask for it, uh, help them to to cement their floor because of um, 
sandy place right now. We're going to cement the floor. And of course, in Myanmar, which we're going to show you later on, that we actually rented that premise in, in Myanmar. You got to rent one year in advance. So it is a capital sound that we need to do. I'm going to read to you Psalm 85. Your mercy and your truth has married each other. Wow, that's amazing. Truth and mercy come together. Your righteousness and peace have keys. Flowers of your faithfulness are blooming on the earth. Righteousness shine down from the sky. Yes, the Lord keeps raining down blessing. See, the Lord keeps raining down. <laughs> in the last trip, it was pouring rain. It's unusual in the Holy Land. Keeps raining down blessing after blessing, and prosperity will drench the land with the bountiful harvest. Say the person right, bountiful harvest. Something good is going to happen. How do we get a harvest? Keep sowing. And other people say, Hello everyone, and welcome home to RLC. If this is your first time here, head down to the Vineyard Lounge where you can receive a free gift from us and know more about our ministry here in RLC. updates and sermon notes, you can download our app. Just search for Renewal Lutheran Church. Follow us on Instagram at Oasis of Care and Ablaze RLC. Whatever comes my way, I will lift you up. Father, we want to thank you that you've given us a promise eyes have not seen, ear have not heard what you have prepared for us. We want to thank you, Lord, for the unprecedented blessing that you have prepared, the great harvest that you have for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we rebuke and bind every foul, wicked, evil spirit. We're going to go from here right now in Jesus' name that your word may have free course in the midst of us. And other people scream. Now, we continue the study on what Christ did for us on the cross. Remember last week, we could talk about the five areas that Christ's blood was shed. First area was uh, from his sweat gland, how in the extreme stress, that sweat gland bursts and out come water and blood and heals the sweat in our workplace. In other words, you're going to have rest even as you come to his presence. And also, blood flows from his hand and his feet. 
uh, as ugly neighbor bunch through the palm of their hand at the risk. And you know what? That God can bless the work of your hand. And blood flowed from his back. Remember, he got 39 lashes, and each of those lashes split apart the skin, exposing the bone, and blood flows that you may be healed. Even as you see the agony on the cross, you know that you don't have to bear your agony because by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. Let me see blood flow from his head. There was this uh, crown of thorns placed over his skull, splitting the skin, exposing the skull. They spit it on him. They shame him. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the shame offering. You don't have to walk through life covered, bowed down by shame. What you have done in the past, you can walk tall because Jesus is a shame offering. Instead of your shame, Christ, because he did for us on the cross, gives you double honor. Instead of on the right, double honor for you. And then blood flow from his side. It's an indication, some people say, as doctors confirm, is there is this muscle tear in the heart that brought forth water in the pericardium sac surrounding the heart. And the spear plunged through. Outcome, water and blood, an indication of heart failure. Now, whether he died of heart failure, I, I, I will tell you in the right time. But the point is that up on the cross, his heart was completely broken because he took the penalty that we deserve, that we may receive the supernatural grace and favor of God. Now, today we're going to touch on the seven last words that Jesus Christ spoke. And uh, on March the 4th, 1841, the ninth president of the United States, his name is William Harrison, gave perhaps one of the longest, in fact, the longest inaugural speech in history. 9,000 words, took about two hours. And despite the pouring rain, the staff had said, hey, cut it short. No, 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 the nation need to hear what I say. Later on, <laughs> he got ill because of the rain, because of the cold, and he died a month later. It could be well said that no president has ever said so many things but done so little. But in comparison, Jesus Christ, not 9,000 words, up on the cross, he spoke seven words. And uh, it can be said, and I believe it is true, that no one has ever said so little and done so much. So we're going to look at the seven last words of Jesus Christ today, perhaps only we can have time to do four. And we're going to look at the four Gospels. So, Pastor, why four Gospels? This is really why we produced a note for you to keep at the last page, tell you why we have the four Gospels. Because the first three Gospels is called the Synoptic Gospel. It comes from the Greek word synosis. I'm sure you know the meaning. It means seeing together. Say it, seeing together. So, in other words, the four Gospels build up a complete picture of Christ that once you know what he has done, we're going to experience unprecedented blessing. And it's amazing. Matthew traced Jesus' ancestry all the way to Abraham because he is the promised Messiah. And the key word in Matthew's gospel is the word fulfilled. Remember, there are 300 prophecies pertaining to Jesus Christ from the Old Testament, spanning a period of about 1,500 years. They all speak one thing, the coming of the Messiah, his birth, his resurrection, how he died. The chance of all this Prophecy being fulfilled in one person is one in a hundred quadrillions. That means a mathematical impossibility. And that is Matthew. And then we look into Mark. Mark comes from the Roman background. If you guys are business entrepreneurs, you might like Mark's gospel because it's written from the Roman perspective. The Romans, they are the world conqueror, business entrepreneurs. One of the things you need to see is the Mark that focus on power. Focus on work, focus on miracles. And the key word in Mark's gospel, you find it repeated time and again in Mark's gospel, is the word immediately. And portray Jesus Christ is a servant who is passionate in serving us, the servant of man. That's Mark's gospel. Then you have Luke. Luke is a medical doctor, a Greek. So you have a Jew, you have a Roman, you have a Greek. A medical doctor, he wrote the gospel in a very systematic, very scientific. That's the reason why last week we talked about uh, Jesus wearing great clothes. And Luke is the only one that wrote 
that actually is thrombosis. This is where we get the word thrombosis. The doctors get the word thrombosis means blood clots. When Christ shed blood and the God of Gethsemane, it's not just ordinary blood, it's clots. Huge clots. Thrombosis. Thrombosis. Of blood. So that was something that only Luke mentioned. And then we have um, the key word in Luke is the word grace. And interesting, Luke traced Jesus' ancestry to Adam <laughs> because he portrayed portray Jesus Christ is the perfect man, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Grace is the key. Grace for sinners. And then you have John. John is a style of <laughs> He traced Jesus' ancestry to the beginning of time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it resembles Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So John portrayed Jesus as the Son of God. And the key word in John's Gospel is the word glory. We have behold His glory, glory as the only begotten Son of God. It's not written in a chronological order. It is basically bringing out the seven key miracles that Jesus Christ performed, bringing out amazing, astounding, revelational truth on who Jesus Christ is. For example, the first miracle, turning water into wine, tell us our God wants us to have joy and the best. So you find that this whole gospel from different background, from Jew, from Greek, from Roman, from a scientific background, put together, synthesized a complete picture what Christ did for us on the cross. And that releases unprecedented blessings. And today we'll look at the four gospel story and see, put the jigsaw passes together and see how, uh, what Christ did for us on the cross when up there. Seven words that change world history. The first word is astounding. He said, Father, forgive them. Luke 23. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Now the first word Jesus Christ spoke on the cross deal with the root problem of the world today. How many of the root problem of the world today is sin. And that causes us to lose God's presence. What happened? Adam lost the presence of God. Pastor, what do you mean sin? I never cheated, I never killed, I never murdered. Key thing about sin is when we ignore God in our life. That's what happened to Adam. He lost the presence of God. That is the root cause of the stress and all the uh, problems in the world because man cannot leave this earth, enjoy this world, this creation, without God's presence. And Christ came to address that. He dealt with the sin problem. And he did it in Ephesians 1 verse 7 this way. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. What do I mean being forgiven? First and foremost, we've got to look at the word redemption. Pastor, how this big word? Yeah, we've got to know this word and see how it's being defined. Redemption is a picture of what happened when we sin. Jesus Christ tells us when we sin, we think we enjoy it. Well, I mean, we indulge in all the drugs and all the vices. We think, man, we're having a good life. But actually, Jesus Christ said, when we sin, actually become a slave to sin. And what Christ did for us on the cross, he redeemed us from sin. In other words, he paid the ransom and took us out of the slavery. That's how it's being defined in the dictionary. Uh, the word redemption means to be set free by a ransom paid in full. Say, paid in full. That means freedom from debt, slavery, curse, and the penalty of sin. And then also the word forgiveness. What do you mean by forgiveness? I try to make it as simple as possible, a definition. Being forgiven simply means to be pardoned. And when you are being pardoned, it is as if you have never sinned. <laughs> That's the word. And uh, it's being justified. Also, another big word, justified. Put it plainly, simply means just as if we have never sinned. Pastor, like that, there's no justice in the world. Can you imagine the judge declare somebody guilty and set him free? There's no justice. Well, God is just in forgiving us because he paid for our sin. Jesus Christ bore the penalty for our sin so that God can bless you, God can forgive you in a just way. 
The, many people today are struck with guilt and condemnation because of the bad choice, ugly choice they've made in their life, in their relationship. The thing that they miss the best of what God has for them. Hey, how many of us know when we make a bad choice, God is not surprised. God always has comebacks for every setbacks. Look at men and women of God in the Bible. Look at Peter. Man, he denied Christ three times. But you know what? God has already got ready for him. Come back. And after the resurrection of Christ, astounding, he preached. 3,000 people got saved. And he's been called to build his church. Look at Paul, the one that persecuted the believers. Yesterday I was watching the super book with my grandchild. And first we look at Paul how he persecuted, and then we look at how he preached the gospel and the shipwreck. And can you just imagine this guy who was persecuting believers, but transformed, and became the preacher of the faith that he condemned, and wrote three quarters of the New Testament. How many of us know God have come back for every setback? I can tell a story like um, Rahab, who was a prostitute. Who would imagine God can use a prostitute? And he did transform her life as became the human ancestor of Jesus Christ. So it's amazing because in him we have forgiveness of our sin. We are redeemed, set free from our slavery to sin. So the point is that God is never tired of forgiving you, of forgiving us of our sin. The only problem, we are tired or we're feeling unworthy to come to him to receive that forgiveness. Pastor, do we need to confess all our sin to get forgiveness? That is an impossibility. You can't possibly confess all your sin. Martin Luther tried to do that before he was born again. He confessed his sin to the priest from the Catholic those days. They have this confession. He did it for six hours and still feel wretched. And then the priest said, come on, you're going to commit something worse. You come back, something dramatic. And he still don't feel that peace in his heart. Hey, the Bible tells us our forgiveness is not based upon your confession, it's based upon the riches of His grace because the blood of Jesus Christ. And all the people say, Amen. So, so what do we confess our sin? The Bible tells us confess our sin. We confess our sin not to get forgiveness. We have already been forgiven. We confess our sin to acknowledge where our faults is that we can receive power and support to overcome our sin. We can see that in James. Admit your faults to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Why do we acknowledge our fault? That we get, get power and support to help us overcome the weakness that is in us. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we have already, because we're in Christ, forgiven past, present, and future. So Pastor, how can God forgive our future sin? Respective to the cross, all sins are future. And interesting, the Bible tells in 1 Corinthians 11, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and gave it to his disciples. Then he poured wine and gave it to his disciples and said, it's the blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin. On the night he was betrayed. Did they betray Jesus at that point in time? There was still the future. But Jesus Christ said, already that the, my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin. None of it has already been forgiven, the future sin. And the point is that how many must know that forgiveness is not based upon our confession, it's based upon what Christ did for us on the cross. Also, like that, you preach people gonna sin more. <laughs> there was a story in Luke chapter 7. There was this particular lady that came to Jesus and anointed Jesus with an expansive bottle of perfume. And he cried, and he, she cried, and washed Jesus' feet with her tears. And of course, Simon, the Pharisee, they invited Jesus Christ. Deep inside, in his heart, was wondering, this man is a prophet, he would have known this is a dirty woman. And Jesus Christ can hear what Simon said. And he rebuked Simon. Notice, even in the rebuke to Simon, he was so gracious. He said, Simon, Simon, when I come, you don't even wash my feet which is, of course, simple courtesy. But this woman has never ceased wiping my feet with her tears. He never anoint me with oil, which is a common courtesy. Any guests would be treated this way. But he never did that 
but the woman have anointed me with an expensive perfume. And he said, Simon, Simon, he that has been forgiven much, love much. Say to me, forgiven much, love much. See, when you realize how much you have been forgiven, man, you got to love much. Also, you see like that, people got to take advantage. You forgive, forgive, forgive. People take advantage of me. How? Now, forgiveness is free. Trust is earned. Somebody cheated you in your business. Doesn't mean that when he says sorry and apologize, doesn't mean that you bring him back into business partnership. Yeah, trust is earned. Somebody cheated you even before marriage and many, many times, not once, and come back to you, I'm sorry, honey, I'm sorry. Now, of course, you forgive him, but it does not mean you marry him. <laughs> so forgiveness is free, trust is earned. And when you understand how much you have been forgiven, and you experience amazing, astounding blessing. Romans chapter 4, verse 7. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. You know, why do you think the devil keep you? The devil keep you from being conscious of your complete forgiveness? Because he knows there are tremendous blessings when you realize how much you have been forgiven. You know, sometimes we dare not ask big things. In the trip, we ask our people to ask three big things. And I imagine some people say, I'm not worthy. I just ask little thing. And it's because we don't know, we don't feel that we have been forgiven, even though Christ has already forgiven us, past, present, and future. And because we don't feel it, it keeps us from releasing faith to receive. If you go around life thinking that, man, you're harvesting the, the consequence of what we have done, you're not going to believe God for the great in gathering, fruitful in gathering that we have because you, you feel you are harvesting the consequences. Hey, how many know when Christ's blood shed on the cross, God broke the curse of that consequence, and right now you are receiving what He deserves, and other people say, Amen. And, um, and when you think that God has not forgiven you, and you're always conscious of your sin, another thing is that you've got to be very really hard on people. Because you think God is hard on you, you become very hard on people like the Pharisees. Uh, Simon the Pharisee, he don't think he has much to be forgiven. Sure, he has much that he has done, but, but he don't feel that he has need of forgiveness. Because of that, he didn't love much. He didn't even do some common anointing, a great honored guest that he has invited, washing the feet of a great honored guest. Because he don't feel that he needs the forgiveness. But that lady who know that she has been forgiven, life has totally transformed. When you don't know you have been forgiven much, you've got to be hard on people. I recall Nelson Mandela, you recall he was in prison for 27 years in solitary confinement, not just a normal prison, solitary confinement for 27 years when he was being released. Reporters were all out there asking him, what do you feel about those people that jail you? Do you get angry, upset? And Nelson Mandela said, when as I walk out the door towards the gate of the prison that would lead me to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness behind, if I didn't leave my hatred behind, I will still be in my prison. The point is that God wants you to forgive others. When you realize how much you have been forgiven, it's because you're not going to be stuck in the past. You're going to be able to lay hold of the great future that you have. Now, one of my favorite Second World War movies is Scarlet and the Black. And they talk about the real story of the Roman Catholic priest by the name of Hugh O'Flaherty that saved about 6,500 people. They are Jews, they were are partisans, they are Americans, they're British. And those are the story, the real story of a guy who was an SS chief in Italy, in Rome. His name is Herbert Kepler. And um, he deported about 2,000 Italians. And those people that he had deported, only 16 survived. And he co-heartedly massacred 335 Italian civilian during the war. And yet this guy have the audacity 
to come to the priest for help. When the allies come and the partisans will come, and when the partisans lay hand upon his family, his family will be finished. Watch this clip. God, wait. I know about you and your church. I've been talking to people. I know all about you. What is it you want from me, Kaffer? They say that you can't pass a beggar or a lame dog, but that you see yourself with some sort of obligation to look after anyone in trouble. You help British and American prisoners, Jews, Arabs, refugees, anybody. It's a part of your faith. Is that right? Well, I wouldn't deny it. That's why I became a priest. Brotherly love and forgiveness. That's the other half of what you believe. True? True. Well, I'm glad of it. Because I have three more for your mercy wagon. My wife and two children. If the partisans get them, they will be killed. I want them out of Rome and safe. That's what I want from you, priest. You're asking me to save your family. If you really believe what you preach, you'll do it. You expect me to help you after what you've done. You think you can demand forgiveness? You think it comes automatically just because you want it. I'm not talking about myself. You've turned this city into a concentration camp. You've tortured and butchered my friends. You've violated every principle of God and man. I can't believe it. After all you've done, you want mercy. I told you. Time to time we're going to face people like that, that they want the priest mentioned you violated every principle of God and man. And yet, they come to you for forgiveness. Do you forgive them? The answer is yes. Not for his sake, but for your sake. That we not be stuck in the past. Did the father, Catholic father, forgive Kepler? I believe it is, because in prison, when this Kepler guy was being interrogated, why his children managed to escape to Germany? then Kepler realized that the father, Catholic father, would have arranged the safe passage of his family members. The priest regularly visited him, and eventually Kepler was being baptized in prison. Because this priest was not stuck in the past, and he lay hold of the great thing that God had for him. And he received an OBE, the Order of the British Empire, and a special recognition by the Pope, because the Pope at one time was not very supportive of his action because of the jeopardy, so to speak, the Vatican's diplomatic immunity, and uh, it would destroy all the treasures of the church. Watch this. This is something I wanted you to see, Monsignor. The glories of the Vatican Palace that I used to love so much when I was a boy now packed away down here. Irreplaceable treasures, Leonardo, Raphael, and relics infinitely more precious of St. Francis, of St. Catherine of Siena, the records and archives, letters, St. Augustine, Martin Luther, even from... When the Allies finally liberated and the Pope is about to give a message to the people, he called in this Catholic priest and acknowledged his error. Watch this. A few moments. This is a great day. I have to speak to our people. But first, I wanted to speak to you. In this imperfect world, you may never receive the honor that is due to you. But I wanted you to know that in my heart, I honor you. I talked to you once of the treasures of the church. Perhaps I deceived myself. The real treasures of the church 
What makes it imperishable is that every once in a while someone comes to it, my son, like you. May the Lord watch over you. The real treasure of the church is not the painting, the Vatican Museum, the Raphael, Michelangelo. The real treasure is people whose lives that have been touched by grace and releasing grace. The real treasure is the power of forgiveness. When you receive that grace, you could be able to release grace upon others. Number two, the next word, Jesus Christ spoke on the cross that impacted the world is he said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 41. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Two words I like to take note is the word paradise. And the same word as Eden. And it's the restoration that Adam has lost. You can see that in Psalm 36 and verse 8, you feast on the abundance of your house and you cause them to drink of the streams of your delight. And the word delight, literally in the Hebrew, is Eden. And God is restoring Eden to us. What Adam has lost, and interestingly, Christ said, today. Now, did the guy who talked to Jesus, got a chance to get down and confess his sins, got a chance to pray six others, he got a chance to, uh, to give. Of course, giving is important. But Christ said, today. In other words, how many of us know, it's not based upon your performance, what you did. And so now we don't feel that we deserve. And they, because of that, we dare not ask big. And uh, sometimes we ask, and the devil will whisper, uh, yeah, you did this, you did that. You don't deserve. Let me tell you, don't argue with the devil. Tell the devil. If you ever hear say, you don't deserve this, you don't deserve that, tell the devil. Devil, you are absolutely right. Not just 100% right, you are 101% right. I don't deserve it. But I'm receiving not what I deserve. I'm receiving what Christ deserves. Does Christ deserve the best? Yes, I rest my case. And other people say, Amen. Because today is not about your work, it's today. All that the guy did is to look to Jesus. And uh, recently I came across John Wesley again. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist movement. He came from a very strict disciplinary background. He joined the Holiness Club and prayed from four in the morning, long hours, fasting, ordained as an Anglican uh, priest. But it was very hard on people and strict rules, and one time he refused Holy Communion to someone, because of that he was being sued. <laughs> he ran off to Germany, and he was among a group of Lutheran missionaries, among the Moravians. Uh, check out on the Google, Moravians. He, the first time he heard about saving by grace, because he always believed that it is the fruit of faith, the fruit of faith that proves that you are saved. So in other words, you're never sure you've got to be saved. You are saved. Still, he was not convinced. Finally, he went back to London, whereby he ministered to someone who was about to be hanged. He preached the gospel to him, got him saved, and said, believe in Jesus Christ and you're going to be saved. The guy had no chance <laughs> to develop the fruit of faith. And deep inside, even though he said that, believe and you're going to be saved, in the in his heart, he couldn't believe. Until the evening, he went to a prayer meeting among a, a group of Moravian brothers, and they were reading Martin Luther's commentary to the book of Galatians, and uh, with the testimony of how lives are being transformed by grace. And when they read about grace, it is not what you do, it what Christ did. It's grace. He wrote later on a testimony that he felt when Martin Luther's commentary was being read, he felt his heart strangely warm. And he said, that is my true conversion. Later on, he started to preach grace. He was ejected out <laughs> from that state church. And he started to preach among minors and sinners. And man, he saw 
Thousands of people got saved. This is the start of the Methodist movement. And uh, people got filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, fall under the power of God. Hammermans knew that it is by grace you have been saved. Christ said that the rubber have no chance to do any good work. All that that guy did is look to Jesus Christ and Christ said today. In other words, right now, you can have the assurance that you are being saved is not based upon your work, but that grace is going to produce fruit. But right now, you know you have been saved. Okay, the third word, Jesus Christ's book is amazing. Woman, here is your son, John 19. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Well, when he was up on the cross, he was suffering excruciating pain. Remember the word excruciation? Come from the word ex cross. Coming out of the cross. He was experiencing excruciating pain. But even in the midst of the pain, he is concerned by his loved one, his mother, earthly mother. And he entrusted the care of his mother to his beloved disciple, John. Even in the midst of pain, he cares. I mean, thank God for all the loved ones that we have and good ones that impacted our lives, our father and mother or brother or sisters or friends. But let me say, no matter how good the person is, there's always a streak of weakness. Only Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, is altogether lovely. He's like a lovely cut diamond. No matter how you look at him, he shines with brilliance. Human beings, no matter how good they are, there's always some kind of a weakness. Like people that are strong, sometimes they can be very hard. But Jesus was strong, but he was gentle. Remember when the soldiers came to take Jesus from the garden of Gethsemane? And Jesus said, who do you want? They're looking for Jesus, Nazareth, the soldiers said. Christ simply said, I am. The soldiers all fell back. Man, this amazing power. I am. But remember, Peter came along and cut off the slice of the ear of the soldier. Jesus took the ear, put back to the soldier's head, and healed him. Can you imagine? Jesus healed the guy that came to arrest him. Man, he is strong but gentle. And he is bold, but not hard on people. He was very bold with the Pharisees. He said to the Pharisees, what was too? He rebuilt Peter, get behind me, Satan. But he was so gentle with a woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. And he said, when everybody took off and couldn't condemn her, and Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He was bold, but not hard. And he was humble but full of glory. You recall last week we talked about how he was crowned with a crown of thorn. They mock at him, they laugh at him, they accuse him of things that he didn't do. The Bible tells us so meek, he didn't even answer a word. I don't know about you, me, if I'm in that situation, or some of us, maybe if we throw stone through, handful and throw chairs. But Jesus Christ was quiet. And yet he was not a walkover. When Pilate, a seasoned historical record tells us Pilate was a very hard, wicked man, very rough soldier. When he saw Jesus totally disfigured, the Bible says Isaiah 52, he was marred beyond human recognition, given to the nine lashes. I mean, he's a chopped up human body. And with all the sweat, with all the speedum, when Pilate looked at him, he withdraw back in, in fear. He said, what kind of a man is this? He said, behold the man. Even in that condition, he shines with royal regality. He shines with dignity. Hey, only Jesus can be a Jesus. He said, he is the only one who really able to satisfy and fulfill our deepest need. Thank God for all the other people that are about you, that supported you. Maybe the mother or father or brother or friends. But they're always up to the point. It's an area of weaknesses. But only Jesus Christ can satisfy your deepest need. You look to a human being to satisfy your deepest need. You're going to be frustrated. 
met, but you will never be frustrated when you look to Jesus Christ. Lastly, that I'm going to address today is the fourth word that Christ spoke on the cross is, I am thirsty. John 19. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Now Mark described it very vividly. Uh, Mark 15 tells us when the wine mixed with myrrh was given to him, he refused it. But when it was given wine that is sour, sour wine, he took it. Why? Because myrrh is inside an anesthesis, right? They're given people in being crucified to kill the pain. Jesus refused that because he why? He came to bear our pain. He, he wanted to experience pain in all its intensity so they can take your pain. You can have his peace. But when it comes to uh, sour wine, sour wine is a picture of curse. And Jesus wanted to take our curse. He took the curse of hunger, took the curse of thirst that you may be satisfied. Remember in George the Four, there was this particular lady, and Jesus go all the way to that woman in Samaria. And in the heat of the day, uh, that woman came to co- take water. Why do you think the woman can take water in the heat of the day when most of the ladies would go and take water in the evening when it's, it's cooled down? Because he was trying to run away from all those ladies because of his so-called unclean past. He has five husbands, the one that's living with, not even the husband. And he just avoid all the giggling, all the <laughs> gossip. And he experienced, she experienced an acceptance that she never experienced in her life. Jesus asked her for a cup of water. Man, he, she sends such an acceptance she never experienced ever. And Jesus, beyond giving that acceptance, offer her living water. Look at the passage, John chapter 4. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of, it, of water welling up to eternal life. The fact is that Christ is able to give us living water. It's because he suffered thirst for us that we may experience that fulfillment in our life. And Ezekiel, the prophet, Ezekiel 47, prophesied that in the last day, something miraculous is going to happen, that water will flow from the eastern side of the temple, it's going to flow down from Jerusalem, from the Kindron Valley. It started off with a trickle. Some of us, though, don't despise the day of small beginning. It started off with a trickle, it became a stream, and into rivers, that is going to heal the Dead Sea. Pastor, this is just impossible. Now, even today, physically, it's possible that the, the trip that we had, uh, the day before we took off the Red Sea, we heard that the place was flooded, the, the road. Because sometimes, typical in desert places, they just call riverbed, dry riverbed. Uh, the local language is wardi. Yeah? And you may be hiking and there's no rain. But suddenly, the whole place will be flooded. That's why they say walking into the body can be very dangerous because it may be not raining, but uphill. In Jerusalem, raining, and suddenly the flood will come. Watch this. And there was this Kindron Valley and the Holy City, and dry as can be. And the Kindron Valley connects the Holy City right to the Dead Sea. And yeah, it's one street down a fall of 3,000 feet. When it rains in the holy city like this, it's going to overwhelm and it floods down the stream and uh, huge waterfalls and overwhelm the road. You see the road here was flooded. It was impossible the day before. Uh, We go there and streaming down and drop down many, many uh, hundreds of feet and flooding even the dead sea. And you see how it drops down from 3,000 feet above sea level to 300 feet below sea level and flooding even the Dead Sea. 
And the thing about when you walk in the wadi, drive a little bit in the valley, you think there's no flood. <laughs> but there was rain in the city. What a beautiful picture. Sometimes you go through life and think, nothing is happening, Pastor. There is no rain. Just because you couldn't see it does not mean he is not working. He is always working on your behalf, arranging things in your favor. Pastor, I don't feel anything. Just because you don't feel anything does not mean he's not working. He's already arranging things in your favor. And you're walking down the, the, the wadi, you think it's dry. But there was rain in the holy city. In the last day, the water will flow from the east and come and heal the Dead Sea. One of the things about the Dead Sea is that people say there's nothing. They, <laughs> but today they found the richest deposit of minerals in the world, and they have many expensive Dead Sea products. And put it this way, how many of us know this living water that Jesus Christ released from the cross can even revive dead situation. Say, Pastor, but I'm not worthy. <laughs> um, look at the story in Matthew 8. There was this guy that has leprosy, came to Jesus. Now, under the law, even if the high priest touched a leper, no matter how holy he was, being the high priest, the high priest become unclean. But step in Jesus Christ, who is greater than the great high priest. And you notice what he did with this leper? Watch the video. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Look, a leper! Go away! How dare you come here! You can make me clean. I will do it. Be made clean. Christ does not have to touch this guy. All you need to do is speak and he will be healed. And many people were healed just by the spoken word. But for the leper, Jesus go the extra mile where nobody would do, even the high priest would not do because he would be made unclean. But the great high priest touched the leper. The leper was cleansed and other people say, and because of the living water that is being released because he suffered first for us. I wonder how many of you today do not know Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to receive Jesus into my heart. I want to receive the living water. To come and cleanse me. Give me hope and a future. New beginning, great breakthrough, great harvest. Would you pray this prayer together with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die for me on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. You suffered thirst that I never be thirsty because you are healing me with your fresh living water. I receive you to my heart to be my savior. I know today I'm already in paradise in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord up on the cross said, today, you go with me in paradise. You don't wait until heaven to experience paradise. Right here, you can experience that abundant life. Simply means paradise, abundant life, the fullness of life, the riches of life, every area is because what Christ did for us on the cross.
prayer and want to know more or have any feedbacks, please write to us. Oh,